Howard Bergman. It is June 29, 2010. Thank you, Howard, for coming to the studio. My pleasure. Tell us a little about your your personal educational background before you came to the college. Uh, well, I uh, am a graduate of the Pomfret School up in Pomfret, Connecticut, and then I went to Clark University, uh, where I was a philosophy major and a fine arts uh, music minor. And then I uh, went to, spent my first year of law school at Boston College Law School. And having been away from home, which is this area, for so long, I transferred to UConn Law School. And I got my uh, law degree from UConn in 1963. And then I went down to New York and, uh, for a year and got my master's in law in uh, criminal uh, criminology and comparative criminal law. And so uh, that's pretty much my, my academic background. And how, when did you first get hired at Manchester Community College? <clears throat> this is very interesting. Uh, I, before I came to Manchester, I uh, had seen an ad in the New York Times for a job up at uh, what is now known as Southern New Hampshire University. And uh, I had always wanted to go up north, so I did that for a year. And it was fine. And uh, ironically, one of my colleagues, again, said, did you see, uh, do you ever look at the New York Times uh, offerings in education? I said, well, you know, when I get the paper. And he said, well, you know, there's a job in Manchester, Connecticut you might be interested in. And I said, Manchester, Connecticut? I know Manchester, but there's no college in Manchester. Of course, having been away, uh, I was unaware of uh, all of the early stirrings that uh, um, were going on. In any event, I, uh, I thought, well, that's interesting. Again, I wanted to get back to this area. And so uh, I came down. And I had an appointment with Fred Lowe in the high school in a very, very small office. And um, we must have chatted for an hour, an hour and a half um, about, you know, educational philosophy and where he was going with the college. And he was very, very impressive. I immediately liked him and took a shine to him. And I thought, I really would, would enjoy working uh, at this very nascent school. And so um, he then said to me, well, uh, what, what do you think you would like to teach? And I said, well, I uh, am a lawyer. And I said, I've taught business law. And I said, but I have the specialty in um, the criminal law and uh, what have you. And he said, but what I want you to do is uh, I'll let you teach some business law. So I did that in the early days. And uh, he said, but I want you also uh, to teach. I was interested in sociology. And he said, I want you to teach maybe a couple of sections of that. But he said, what I really want you to do, and I was a little daunted by this, is he said, I want you to set up a program for law enforcement and corrections. And I said, what are you talking about? I mean, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to, you know, prepare a, a two-year academic program in terms of what courses you'd want to have uh, for police officers and correction officers. So, uh, I thought about that, but nothing happened until I arrived on the scene. And so I did, uh, in the early stages before Tom Connors um, and Frank Zullo came on the scene, I had sort of developed the basic framework of courses that uh, were going to be in that program. And um, later on, of course, what I did is uh, I taught a lot of the courses that were in there, such as criminology, that was always <clears throat> every year in the sp uh, uh, spring semester. And I taught juvenile delinquency in the fall, and I taught intro sociology. And I had moved uh, essentially away from the business 
department. I guess I might might have been in the business department. So that's sort of how I uh, um, got into the scene. And he said, well, you know, we don't have a campus. I said, I said, well, where do you, where does everything go on? He said, right here in the high school. And I said, well, how do you do that? And he said, well, we don't do anything until after 3 o'clock in the afternoon because we have to wait for the high school students to leave. So uh, it was essentially an afternoon, evening kind of uh, job um, teaching. And uh, this, the classes were much smaller then. I mean, you probably had, uh, I'm thinking, maybe 20 uh, the students were uh, very um, uh, motivated, and a lot of students were, the, the, the population was older uh, and more female than anything else, except later on when it got into the law enforcement and all of that. And uh, so that's uh, essentially how, you know, the whole thing started. And I was only going to stay one year. And I thought, and I'll look around and see what will happen after that. So and happened? one year uh, came the next year, and it became to feel like an old shoe. And it was very, the faculty were very congenial. You know, we're a very tightly knit group, uh, those of us who were here at the beginning. And a lot of camaraderie. And it just was a wonderful place to be. So you didn't want to look any further, you, you know. Who were some of the people you remember from that era, the faculty, administrative staff? Uh, well, I mean, let's see, at the beginning, I guess, I'm trying to think. Uh, Marsh Elmore uh, taught English. Bob Dobson was in biology. He was here. Bob Fenn who uh, later became dean, was, um, he taught biology. Jim Tatro taught history. And I believe it, even at that very beginning, there was sort of a business department uh, that Fred Ramey, I think, was the head of. And then the social sciences. Uh, and Jim Tatro sort of held uh, that position is what we would call now, I guess, a division director. And um, I don't know if uh, maybe uh, maybe Mario Fiandella, I'm trying to think, was there at the very beginning as well, and he was sort of uh, the overseer of the science programs. Now, when did the college get its first dedicated we were at the high school, I, I don't know exactly how many years, but um, we were there three maybe years, I'm thinking, before uh, uh, Fred Lowe made arrangements for us to move into the Cheney office building on Hartford Road. And there wasn't much renovation, I don't think, done to it. It just had all of these rooms. Um, and uh, we operated at the beginning, I think, between the high school and um, the Hartford Road campus. And for a long time, that seemed like as far as it was ever going to go. And um, we finally did uh, move out of the high school when they obtained uh, this property here. and. Uh, started to build a temporary campus, which is very, very long tempor uh, temporary. And then we would shuttle back and forth, depending on where your courses were, um, from Hartford Road to uh, um, the lower campus. Uh, and of course, that was wonderful. You know, it had air conditioning and it was clean and it was modern and so it began to sort of take on the the uh, 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 the guise of a physical campus and 
at the beginning it wasn't falling apart, so it was all very nice and everything was there. And, and again, a very nice atmosphere, um, just a very warm atmosphere. And Fred was, Fred Lowe was uh, um, a very, very fine president and tried to innovate. Uh, I mean, the way he hired people. I mean, it, we used to joke or joke around. Well, he just you know pick people up off the street and hire them, like I think he did with Dave Gidman. I don't know how that all happened. Dave Gidman was doing something, and he said, "What do you, what's your background?" He said, "Would you be interested in teaching history?" Um, so I uh, a lot of people were you know. Um, some were from the high school later on who had taught um, Bill Dowd, uh, and Jim was from the high school originally. Bob Fenn was. Um, I don't know quite where some of the other ones were. And uh, so that was the status quo there for a good number of years. I'm guessing... <sighs> I'm not sure when the low building went up, but it must have been in the uh, 80s sometime, I think. And uh, at this point in time, I had become a very good and close friend with Nancy and Fred Lowe. And uh, my parents um, would go in the winter to Sarasota. And when they retired, they were in Sarasota. So I saw a great deal, deal of them and was with Fred just uh, a week before he uh, died of bone cancer. Um, anyway, what happened is they put the new building up, the Lowe building, and we dedicated it to uh, Dr. Lowe, and um, I hosted a party for him, I remember. Uh, we, we, we only had two kinds of drinks, his favorites, martinis and Manhattans, and it was quite a party. Uh, and so, you know, he went back to Florida, and uh, the build, that was a wonderful, wonderful feeling to be in that building. I mean, it was brand new. It was not made out of cardboard. It was concrete. It was, it was really the, uh, I think, a significant point in the development of the college because here it was. I mean, it wasn't going to be turned into anything or torn down or, and what have you. And uh, nothing else was here. And uh, we still had the lower campus. And so that made it a lot easier. We had abandoned Hartford Road. And uh, so it was very convenient. I mean, you'd walk down to the lower campus or walk up or what have you. And uh, so I retired in 1992. And so all of these beautiful facilities uh, I think they were being thought of, but uh, there was nothing concrete that had been, you know, developed at that point. So how do you feel when you're, you're sitting in really a state-of-the-art, magnificent structure, and going back almost 50 years, how do you feel about the evolution of the college? Well, one has to be very proud. Very proud. I mean, because, you know, we started at the high school, and now I came in. I've been in here a few times, but it's very easy to get lost in here, and it's very, very beautiful, and I'm sorry, like, I'm sorry Dr. Lowe could not see this, because he would be, oh, uh, he'd be very happy. He really would. Now you've spoken very highly of Dr. Lowe. Are there some other individuals who really had an impact on you and the college during your time here? Uh... Not uh, too specifically. I can think of one person, uh, Bob Miller, uh, who uh, became president of Quinnebog Valley Community College. And I don't know, he was one of the people I first knew sort of in Hartford. I don't know if he, he may have started out in Hartford in the administrative part. Um, and so I knew him, not well, but uh, he, was, he was a good mentor, I think, and I would, uh, he and Dr. Lowe would, were 
pretty close. And after Dr. Lowe retired, Bob Miller became president for a couple of years and was very effective and very well liked. Um, and then, of course, we had other uh, leaders uh, who I don't know how candid I should be, uh, who were really, uh, they didn't hold back the institution, but they were. Uh, uh, the leadership uh, very demoralizing uh, and a lot of um, uh, favoritism and are you on my side or on the other side? Do you know who the communists are in your division? Questions like that, uh, which, you know, but I won't go into much detail about that. I think uh, everybody remembers that who was around pretty clearly. Um, can you recall any humorous stories, situations, anecdotes that really stand out in your mind during your tenure here? Hmm. Offhand, I'm, I'm trying to think. Something will. Uh, um, come up. Well, this goes way back. We used to have our graduations at the high school and um, Dr. Lowe thought it would be a very good idea um, to have a pre-graduation cocktail party at his house. Uh, and it was the first and the last. Um, there were people who were got very rambunctious and uh, one person climbed out of a window and then we went over for graduation and I guess we were somewhat disorderly but it went smoothly but that was we always reminisce about you know how amusing that was and that would never happen again and then I should I should mention this um, I don't think it was a mean streak with uh, Fred Lowe but he scheduled faculty meetings on Friday nights. In the downstairs uh, of the building on Hartford Road. And of course this was after dinner and people were, didn't want to be there. Uh, and I don't know why he did that on Friday night, but um, we always used to joke about that was his way of maybe exerting control over us by having us attend the faculty meetings on Friday night. Um, let's briefly talk about students. Any general reflections on students or even a particular student who may stand out? The students, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, at the beginning seemed to be more motivated. They really wanted to be at the college. But we're talking about another time. We're talking about uh, in the in the middle '60s here, and um, as I also mentioned, uh, the um, the students really uh, were they worked hard. They were good, and most especially uh, women uh, who had never had the opportunity to go to college and had maybe raised some children and decided that yes, they wanted to come. Uh, back and get a degree and uh, there were a lot of them and they were wonderful students and every year uh, the valedictorian would be one of these women. Uh, they made teaching a very worthwhile occupation. Um, they, they asked good questions. They, uh, it was just a very pleasant pleasant atmosphere. The complexion of the student body was, uh, it changed not dramatically, uh, but toward uh, before I retired, uh, it was a younger group, a little bit more restless. Um, of course, it was the time also during the Vietnam War. And uh, I remember, and I don't know if that was a good thing in hindsight, but uh, students who wanted to protest 
against the war in Vietnam had the option of not taking their final exams. I don't know how many people remember that. I thought that was uh, not a good thing. Um, a lot of my students in, uh, in uh, police departments decided that they were going to protest the war, but I don't know that they were out there protesting, but they didn't take their final exams. So, uh, but uh, in, in total, uh, the teaching, it was, teaching here was a, a pleasure. It really was. I mean, I, at a, a, a great number of years, would always anticipate starting in the fall. Of course, I was young and energetic. And, uh, but it was, um, it was a, a nice place to teach. Um, and uh, very supportive if you wanted to do something, you know, uh, innovative. It was always encouraged depending on, on the president at that time. Um, for a lot of the period of time, things remained very static. Um, not much really went on, sort of like an empty space. But I think that <clears throat> that's the natural course of things because when it starts, it's all fresh and new and, and uh, you can innovate more. Uh, but I think that's probably changing now as well with the, uh, what you can see around here with the uh, facilities and what they're offering, the course offerings. We didn't have that many offerings. You know, we had history, we had English, we had philosophy. Uh, you mentioned other faculty uh, c coming later on. Uh, John Jacobs. Uh, came later on and he taught philosophy and John Crowley came and John taught philosophy and I think anthropology and then of course I would if be it would not be right if I failed to mention Eleanor Coltman um, who was referred to as my mother in the north end of Manchester because she'd make sure every morning coming to school that my car was gone and that I was uh, where I should be, and a very close friend, and her office was down the hallway, and Eleanor developed the social services program and was very instrumental in that, and she taught political science, and she was very, very capable and warm and wonderful person. And, and then Mary Ann Handley uh, came in, and then just whole bunches. We had search committees. I mean, it was not the way Fred did it. We had a committee for position. And the uh, uh, there were always a lot of applicants for these faculty positions. Um, you know, it just wasn't a handful. I mean, uh, having served on uh, several search committees, um, I mean, there could be 50, 75, 100 applicants depending upon what the position was. Um, so in fact, it rather it became competitive uh, in terms of who was finally going to get to fill the position and, you know, interview processes and so on. Your career has spanned uh, about three decades. What are, what are you most proud of? I guess uh, coming from nothing to what you witness here. And so every time I drive in from Hartford, I look at the tower and I say, my God, how far, how far we've come. And so although I haven't, I'm not very familiar with this whole campus and uh, my neighbor across the street, Dave Nielsen, um, said, come on over and I'll show you around, and I should do that. But I was uh, very ill for two years, and I just haven't been able to make it over. So, uh, but I am very proud of, of the tremendous growth and the recognition statewide. I was always called the flagship of the community colleges, and not having been involved now for about 18 years, I, I assume that that title 
still is probably very fitting. Um, the rep, uh, the other thing, of course, is uh, the reputation that it has academically. And uh, I don't know. I think one of the other things that I was very pleased to read about is the ease now of trans transfer that the students here have to go to the State University or to UConn. Uh, they used to make the students jump through hoops, uh, like, you know, you're not good enough. Well, in fact, our students did better than the students who were originally starting at those schools. And, uh, you know, I had really... I had uh, a lot of students who, you know, went to Trinity, went to Wesleyan, went to Harvard, went to law school, and this and that. And so we did a good job. We did a very good job, second to none. Um, and so I was always proud of that even before, you know, it grew to become what it has become. It was, it was just a good school. If I were a new faculty member, someone who was just hired to start my career teaching this fall with MCC, what would you tell me? Uh, give it all you have. Uh, be creative. Um, get your students involved. I don't know what the size of classes are now, but um, the opportunity to get to know your students. I mean, I knew pretty much all of them by name. Um, but to, uh, you know, to uh, keep up certainly in your field of uh, uh, expertise and um, uh, I think you can't always do this at a larger uh, class size institution but to interact with your students and try to get them motivated so that, and to have them enjoy themselves. That's was part of it. And you say, what would you tell them? Enjoy yourself in teaching because uh, it was a, it's a wonderful kind of process. We've covered a variety of areas in the last half hour or so. Is there anything that you want to add that we haven't discussed yet? Oh, I could probably think of a lot of things uh, offhand, off the top of my head. I can't. Um, the, I think, you know, the big milestone stones were, of course, the beginning before I even got here, and there were just a few people involved uh, with uh, Fred Lowe, Eleanor Coltman, I don't know who else, and they try to get this thing, Merrill Rubino, Dr. Rubino, uh, try to get the thing off the ground, and, and as I say, the next year or so is when uh, it started to take off even under the most adverse circumstances uh, in terms of physical uh, facilities. Um, but uh, I would share this with you. Uh, it's anecdotal. Uh, when we were at the high school, we had a trailer in the parking lot at the high school where the business office was. And the business office was headed by Vilma Zaldera, and uh, a thoroughly lovely person. And uh, I was young and cocky then, and she said, Howard, you're going to have to come in. And I don't think we were fingerprinted. Maybe we were, I don't remember. She said, you're going to have to choose retirement plan, plan B or plan C. And I said, Vilma, I... I will provide for my own retirement. In hindsight, that was a very stupid thing to say. And of course, you were required to do that. But, you know, everything was just sort of, sort of new, uh, having come from a, a semi-quasi-private institution up in New Hampshire. Um, I really haven't, didn't, think I didn't have an agenda in terms of I just thought the best thing to do is to just uh, chat about things. And so I'll walk out of here, of course, and think of a whole bunch of things I wish I had mentioned. Um, but uh, it's, it's the, the most, <clears throat> I think, impressive thing is uh, what has happened uh, in 50 years. 
let's see, 66. Yeah, it is. Uh, I don't know where the time went, and it doesn't seem possible that MCC could be 50 years old. You know, wonderful.